And joining us now is Terry Follis, the author of the new political novel, The Best Laid Plans. Welcome to TVO. Happy to be here. Thanks I guess we've got to find out a little more about you for starters. Do you remember how you got interested in politics in the first place? I think it was helping my parents uh, canvas and put up signs for the local conservative candidate uh, when I was just a kid. This will come as a shock to those who've known you a long time because you've been a liberal for a very long time. <laughs> That's right, I have been. So you, you walked the floor, as it were. I did. I crossed the floor when I was uh, in university. You got into it, and you, you got a job in politics eventually. What was I your did. first one? I came out of, uh, out of university, and uh, I somehow managed to land a job on the full-time staff of uh, Jean Chrétien's 84 leadership campaign. I was uh, something called the Ontario Youth Chair, which I'm sure uh, sounds impressive, but really meant I was doing a lot of organizing and envelope licking and, and uh, going to various events and that sort of thing. But that was a real uh, an eye-opener for me and a great experience to think someone was going to pay me to do that. I would have done that for free. Eye-opener in what respect? Well, just to see how politics really works uh, at the ground level. I've been involved with university politics uh, during my time at, uh, at McMaster. Uh, but it was a different world breaking into, uh, into federal politics. You say you, you learned how it really worked on the ground, such as? What did you learn? Well, I learned about, uh, about uh, delegate meetings. I learned about the bare-knuckled politics. I learned the role that uh, organizing skills uh, plays in the game. And uh, I think I had arrived on the scene with a bit more of an idealistic view of what politics was and public service. and. Uh, I think my public service calling took a bit of a, a beating in those early years, but uh, you take the bad with the good. So in one fell swoop, your naivete hit the dirt. Yes, uh, it didn't take long. <laughs> now, Mr. Crenshaw, of course, didn't win that one in 84. He won six years later. So what did you do in those intervening six years? I actually stayed on Parliament Hill in the short-lived uh, Turner cabinet and was able to work uh, for a cabinet minister in Mr. Turner's uh, cabinet. I then stayed for a year in opposition after Mulroney came to power, and in 85, as David Peterson took the reins of office at uh, Queen's Park, I came down to work on the political staff of the finance minister, or called then the treasurer, Bob Nixon. So I was on his staff for, uh, for two and a half years, and after that I went uh, consulting, public affairs and communications consulting, and I've been doing that ever since. Did you enjoy your time in politics? I really did. Uh, I enjoyed it a lot. I felt like I was doing something that was uh, important. Uh, I worked with some really interesting, thoughtful people. Uh, I think I saw both the sort of the seamy underbelly of politics, but also the more inspiring public spirited side when you can work in government and you actually have a chance to do something that uh, advances the public interest. But I also felt that after you know, four, three or four years in that milieu, that uh, you run the risk of uh, never leaving that world if you don't leave uh, after a certain period of time. So I went to consulting after that and, and quite enjoyed that. Now you have, uh, I'm going to do a bit of a shortcut here, you've essentially written the Canadian version of Primary Colors, if you like. This is a political novel which oh. is, uh, you know, it really tries to expose the sort of seamy underbelly of, of uh, a lot of what happens in public life. You've changed the names, I guess, to protect the guilty. <laughs> and I want to know why you wanted to, why'd you do this? Well, kind of you to put it in the same breath of Primary Colors, which is a, an awesome book. I really enjoyed that. But uh, I really just wanted to, well, I followed the writers, the new writer's axiom of, of write what you know. So there's very little in that book that I didn't know something about. There wasn't a ton of research because it's all been kind of rattling around in my head for, uh, for many years. Uh, I think I wanted to make a few comments about uh, politics and how our democracy works. and Or doesn't. Or doesn't. Uh, and to try and put some of those issues on the table, but in a way that's uh, satirical and not intended to be a, a really hard-hitting uh, polemic. Uh, it's, a, it's a pretty light read, I hope, uh, and uh, I hope there's some fun along the way as well. Well, having said that, you know, here's one of your lines. Polls trump policy, politics pummel leadership, the four-year electoral horizon crushed vision. I mean, if, 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 I don't know if you are the protagonist of the book, but if you are the protagonist of the book, this is a guy who, who's had a lot of the joy of politics beaten out of him and is a fairly hard-bitten cynic at the end of the day. Is that That's true. The, the, narrator, uh, the narrator of the novel is, a, is a, a youngish political staffer who doesn't fully represent me. There's a lot of me, I suppose, in him. Uh, but, uh, yeah, he is kind of jaded. He's got a jaundiced view, and he's had that idealism uh, pummeled out of him. Uh, and he wants to leave in, in the hopes of regenerating some 
political idealism, uh, perhaps to live to fight another day in a different kind of a climate when the public interest rather than the political interest uh, holds sway. But just like Michael Corleone, every time he thinks he's out, he's sucked right back into it. He is sucked right back into it. That's, uh, that's what happens, and his attempt to break free uh, is thwarted at the 11th hour. And, uh, but he has a new partner, in a way, in the novel that helps restore some of his uh, uh, sort of idealism and, uh, and, I guess, optimism about the future. Terry, I want to uh, embarrass you a little bit here, because I've known you for a long time. We can <coughs> fess up here. That's right. I've known you for a long time. You're one of the straightest arrows I've ever met. There's a very steamy sex scene in this book. <laughs> and I can see you blushing even now as I try I to... I am, despite the makeup. <laughs> uh, what was it like to write that scene, knowing your parents and family would be reading it at some yeah, point? Yeah, I was looking over my shoulder when I was clacking away at my, uh, at my computer. Uh, it is a, is a little bit out of character, but I thought it worked in the novel, and I needed something dramatic to achieve a goal at that moment in the novel. Uh, but if you will notice, I have actually written that scene using parliamentary language. So, uh, Very, yeah. <laughs> it's, well, no, no, uh, there's no swearing in it. It's no, it's, I attempt not to be quite as, uh, as blatant and overt about it. But. The word caucus was used a number of times, I think. <laughs> yes. Uh, it, it, can you tell me if that's <clears throat> true, that scene? Uh, not in my knowledge, uh, not in my experience. Uh, that was, it is a fictional account. You, you walk in on somebody having sex in a minister's office, basically. Something like that. Yeah, uh, that's, that's, the, uh, that's the event in the episode in the novel. And no, I've never seen that. Uh, I've that heard happen? the odd tale now and then, but uh, probably no more than, than you've heard. So, does that kind of thing happen? Well, I think it happens in every walk of life. <laughs> I imagine it happens in politics uh, as well. <clears throat> Naive and innocent when you arrived, bitter and angry when you left. Uh, again, one of the, uh, the things you take away from the book. Is that the norm in politics? I think it can be. This is a, a satirical novel, so everything's a little bit bigger and a little bit exaggerated, but I think it's not uncommon for people to arrive on Parliament Hill uh, fresh-faced and, and really ready to do what they believe is right for the country. And over time, just uh, the relentless tide of, of politics uh, kind of takes that away from them. And they do leave a little bit embittered and feeling that they have to know how to, they have to know more about organizing a delegate selection meeting than they have to know about what policy we're going to introduce to resolve this social ill the country has. Is that what happened to you? Uh, I will, I, it happened to me a little bit. Uh, yeah, I certainly went to Ottawa and, and to Queen's Park uh, with perhaps naive, but with a more policy orientation than a political orientation. And as I've suggested in the novel, there is this constant tug of war between those who know politics and those who know policy. And it just depends what era we're operating in, which of those uh, holds the balance of power. Is it really possible, to, given, given how you've seen it from the inside, is it possible to clean up politics, um, not dramatically, but even a little bit, just to take some of the stench out of it? I think it is possible. I think it's going to require uh, a visionary leader who, and, uh, maybe, and a completely renewed party, uh, I'm not sure which party, uh, to, to do that, to lead by example and simply not to tolerate that which we have tolerated for so long. But I think it's a, it may well never happen. It's uh, the momentum and the inertia uh, and the way we've done things is, uh, is simply so strong and has been with us for so long. I think it'll, be, it'll take a pretty extraordinary set of circumstances to turn that around. But baby steps, uh, maybe we can do something. Are you still